you, you are now about to witness the strength of street knowledge. Let's discover how a couple of months, but it's this, this, this enough for you to know what's up in the hood. Bueno, que ha cambiado mucho porque me enseñó a trabajar en este país, me enseñó a valorar que aquí nada te regalan, todo es a base de trabajo, donde tú vayas a vivir tienes que pagar tu renta, tu luz, tu teléfono y miles de gas. Eso es una parte bien importante que a veces nosotros como hijos, cuando somos menores de edad o tenemos la edad de 17, 18 años, somos bien variables, nos quejamos de todo, que pensamos que nosotros merecemos todo, cuando no hemos trabajado para merecer nada. Entonces eh, yo creo que es una parte a veces de la parte de la adolescencia que yo pasé por ahí y cuando llegué aquí pues prácticamente tuve que trabajar y supe lo que es ganarse un peso y un dólar. Cada minuto, ¿eh? desde levantarte temprano en la mañana, preparar tu comida, agarrar el autobús bajo cero, la nieve, híjole, es difícil. Ah, ¿Por qué escogió venirse a Chicago? Bueno, primeramente yo vine a Chicago engañado. <risa> engañado, no, mira, yo acababa de terminar mi, mi, mi preparatoria, mi bachillerato. Iba a empezar el primer año de universidad. Y un amigo me dijo, oye, vamos a Chicago, mira, este, allá y se gana mucho dinero, tú juegas bien fútbol, te consiguen un buen trabajo y vas a ganar el dinero del mundo. En ese aspecto, en el, yo decía, wow, pues a lo mejor sí es cierto. Veía las películas y decía, no, sí. ¿Por qué me gusta? Porque es una ciudad buena, una ciudad próspera, hay muchas cosas buenas para los estudiantes, si saben aprovecharlo, saldrían adelante fácilmente, porque hay muchas becas en las escuelas, hay muchas ayudas en los parques, hay muchas cosas para la gente que le gusta el deporte, y entonces en otros lugares no creo que haya las mismas oportunidades que en esta ciudad de esta de Chicago, Illinois. Um, ¿Hace suficiente dinero para vivir una vida confortable? Dependiendo. Sí. Dependiendo en dónde trabajo, los estudios que haya tenido y las oportunidades que yo pueda obtener en la vida. ¿Actualmente crees que es suficiente para vivir una vida confortable? No. ¿Por qué? Porque hay muchos impuestos altos y nuestros uh, salarios no son muy altos donde nosotros trabajamos. ¿Ha cambiado tu vida desde que te viniste a los Estados Unidos? Sí, bastante. En nuestro país desgraciadamente es un poco más difícil que aquí para encontrar trabajo, para sobrevivir, mucho más difícil allá que aquí. ¿Cómo, cómo sientes sobre escuchar las noticias que van a hacer a la ciudad de Chicago una ciudad santuaria? Es bueno para todos los trabajadores como nosotros que somos latinos, que venimos de otros países, aprovechar las oportunidades que nos da esta ciudad, de que sea un santuario, nos sentimos más protegidos, con ganas de salir más adelante, ya de marcha. Ah, no lo siento tanto así, pero probablemente a veces algunos han sido discriminados. Muchas veces se ha visto en las noticias que mucha gente ha sido discriminada por su color de raza, pero yo hasta ahorita, gracias a Dios, no he sido discriminado, no me siento así discriminado. Well, the vision of the restaurant is to open up different concepts to our communities where they need it the most. So we realized in the inner cities of Chicago that there's a shortage of healthier concepts, so we decided to open up a healthier concept in this community in West Humble Park. The connection to food and culture is the thought process of when you eat better, you do better, meaning that if you're eating healthier foods, then you may think different and make better decisions. 
so it can impact the culture and the environment that you live in. <laughs> what dish are you making for us today? Some country pork ribs. Um, it's a South Carolina dish. Um, you actually just wash your country pork ribs off in the sink. After you wash them off, you get you some seasoning, garlic powder, onion powder, seasoning salt. Everything is done cooking. I have my little sauce made up and I dip them in the sauce and maybe put them back on the grill. Sometime I might put them in here, put this back on the grill and simmer. Yeah, I learned from my father. When I was a little younger, he used to, he used to teach me how to cook, so I just used to watch him and learn from him how he was cooking. My name is Musa Yala, and I work at La Parma, which is a Puerto Rican restaurant, a Borico restaurant. We also have a mixture of culture in our store. Here, a lot of people look forward to a lot of veggie, a lot of the carne guisa, the soup. A lot of people walk in here for a lot of things they look forward to that they don't get in their hometown in Puerto Rico. There's nothing going to be the same. Um, everybody got different ways of cooking. Here, we do a lot that we don't do in our hometown. Here, we get a variety. We don't get that in our hometown in Puerto Rico. It's not how it's made differently, it's how the people make it. Everybody got different ways of making it, different seasoning. Puerto Rico, we use a lot of homegrown. Everything comes like fresh from the ground. All that grows, and we, you know, we live off of that in Puerto Rico. Puerto oh, Rican food is awesome. I love my rice with pigeon peas and uh, pork on the side. Uh, you gotta have your sweet plantains. Awesome with sweet plantains. Uh, Dumplings are also well, uh, known as alcapurias. Um, come visit the Palma whenever you guys get a chance. Awesome food here, awesome environment, and uh, love the employees, especially the, the, the lady that was on here earlier. She's really famous. Basically, because it reminds me of mine. Um, normally, that's how we were raised. We were raised on making these traditional dishes just to remind us about, I guess, who we are, where we come from. So that's normally why. I mean, it's like a routine. And we make it every day. It's either yellow or white. We use, normally I think the popular one is Goya. This is what they use, the Goya adobo. I use this one because it's less salt. This is the third part of preparing the Ibaritos. Now we're down to smashing them and refining them again into their golden brown. We're reporting from the local square, Humble Park community, a neighborhood known for its art and its activism. We wanted to know the connection between the two. The organization we've chosen were King Lizzie and the Graffiti Zone. So come with us to find out more. Uh, my name is Miguel Rodriguez and I'm from West Humble Park, Chicago. Uh, and the organization is Graffiti Zone and we're basically a platform for youth to discover themselves through the arts. My name is Adam A.D. Um, I'm one of the King Lizzie recording studio artists. Um, I'm also a resident of Humble Park. I'm a recording artist. Um, we love to help the community get kids out the streets, use our stories. Uh, it's definitely hands-on learning. Uh, no like A, B, fill in the bubble kind of thing, but actually um, we want to see results. So if we want to see a slam team uh, perform, we're going to have a slam team perform. If 
if we're gonna have not just a bunch of writings that we're gonna say we're gonna put on an art show, we're gonna have uh, the best art that we possibly can create. Uh, the type of music we do, I would call, I would call it message music. Um, because we like to tell our stories and, and try to relate to kids that are out here going through what we went through. Growing up in West Homo Park, and so I saw at 13 is that age where you kind of start to see what's going on in your neighborhood and who you are in relation to the community, in relation to the rest of the world, and even the universe. What I wanted to do really was um, tell the world that I exist and that I'm here, and I want everybody else to know that I exist. Um, and so that's basically what got me doing graffiti. I used to sing actually before I was rapping, and you know, a lot of people want me to become a singer, and I sing my own hooks and stuff like that, but um, I learned that I can do, put words together better than I sang, so I just pretty much uh, grew into that craft and that gift. And uh, when I realized that I was pretty good at it, I said, well, man, I think this is something I can do. Character corrupted by all the bad company. Can't allow my past to determine my future. Uh, we believe that arts is definitely uh, a way to transform communities. Um, so basically by just being here, um, creating artwork, and becoming the next generation of mentors and leaders uh, is a way of activism. I had one message. I would say elevate your mind. There's a lot of trendiness. Um, I would say, um, you know, remove yourself from the trend to avoid the temptation. Um, I would say pitch your tent um, and outside instead of trying to be in the crowd. Um, definitely stand out, um, be different, be unique. Um, keep God first. Our message to the youth is um, basically education is up to you. Um, whether that's institutional or by yourself as an individual. Uh, we live in the age of technology where you can easily Google anything, go to the library uh, and just educate yourself. Uh, if you have that curiosity within you, um, you can definitely access that. Next time you're in Logan Square, Humble Park area, stop by these organizations to learn more and start things. Lord, please pass the storm by me. Welcome to Hardcover News. My name is Janelle. And I'm Axel. Today's news report is about minorities uniting against police brutality. Many of you guys have heard of the Black Lives Matter movement, but some have been questioning that all lives matter. However, throughout the years, African American people have been discriminated and recently many cases have been made about the deaths of black people. Recently, 32-year-old Philando Castile was shot and killed by a cop when he was trying to take out his license just like he was asked. And with this family witnessing his murder, black lives are taken for granted and overlooked. How can all lives matter if there is still the killing of unarmed black people? Many minorities ask questions about their own race, questioning how the media only focuses on one race and Hispanics dying from police brutality in 2016. Throughout the years with many civil rights movements, minorities have come together with African Americans to fight for the injustices of our lives. Now let's go to Adam to see what the public thinks about this. We're on the 606 trail, and we're here to interview people. My name is Nasut Musa Kafraye. I'm a student teacher at a master teacher partner of Bab Yanun, AKA Dr. Malika Z. York. Yes. Because I'm a part of one. Uh, I'm a Nuwapian, Wunuwupu. Um, I know of identity groups that work toward ending like that type of systemic oppression. Um, I don't know of organizations that mix the two, but they stand in solidarity. Um, actually, in my school, there is there's actually a group called Five Plus One, which brings uh, Latinos together to fight um, off immigration or 
anybody like police going through um, police knocking on doors and saying, oh, you can't, you can't be here. Because we're not minorities, and as long as we let white people tell us we're minorities, we're going to continue to be killed because it is based on a media that we have no control over. We've never had control over the media in this country. We have to remember that America is a racist society that's built off the eradication and the enslavement of people of color. So we can never be surprised <laughs> when the media is in their favor. We gotta wake up to that. Because they really don't focus on us, basically. I think it would make a change because uh, Latinos and African Americans are a big community, especially around here. And if we come together as one, it'll, we'll, we'll probably make a change. I think solidarity is really important. I think solidarity is definitely going to help us move forward. The power of one voice is so much, and the power of many, many voices is going to be even greater. And so if two different groups, two oppressed groups, come together in solidarity with one another's struggles. Uh, unarming the police, demilitarizing them. They, they, they move like military. They don't move like police. Black people are not, nor will we ever be considered United States citizens. We have to remember that. We are considered three-fifths of a human being chattel property. Native Americans are also qualified, classified, and identified as Negro colored and black, which is why they, the race tension between blacks and Latinos is actually frivolous because we the same people. Even Columbus recorded that in his log in 1654 when he first touched the shores of North America. So that's a historically documented fact. I would hope to see changes because uh, police, um, police and the, also the community are just turning on each other and it's making everything worse on us and them because they don't really help us out and we don't want their help because we're too ignorant to accept it. If the public consistently demonizes people of color, like the darker your skin is, the more they're going to villainize you. Now that we got people's opinion, let's move on to Jocelyn. Thank you, Adam. There have been many deaths of minorities with 230 blacks and Hispanics, people dying due to police brutality. Through a study in Harvard University, police are 50% more likely to use force on Hispanics and blacks than white. We all need to question why that's happening, whether it's due to stereotypes or racial profiling. It needs to come to an end. Welcome back to the studio. What we have gathered about people's responses and Jocelyn's and statistics is that instead of making separate movements for Hispanics and African Americans, we need to come together and help our neighbor. I totally agree with you, but unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Remember, we can all change the world together. We'll see you next time in Hardcover News. Justice. And I'm Devana. Since our organization, Community TV Network, is located on the northern edge of Humble Park, we decided to produce a new segment about the history in Humble Park. Let's take a look at how Humble Park has evolved through its 157 year history. Humble Park became a part of Chicago in 1869. In the coming decades, large numbers of German, Scandinavian, and Italian immigrants moved in from neighborhoods to the east. Other nationalities, including Ukrainians, Polish, and Russian Jews, began to also move into Humble Park. By the 40s, the population grew to 80,000 residents. This was the highest number of residents living in Humble Park. With such a diverse history, Humble Park's community has always been a mixture of different languages, foods, traditions, and art. On several streets, you can see beautiful murals that tell the history of the community. Many of the murals date back to the 1970s, and some are the oldest public art murals still in existence in the country. Murals tell a story of struggle, survival, and equality. 
Humboldt Park is widely known for its Puerto Rican population, but over the years, population has declined more than 23% from 1990 to 2000. But let's think about the community as a whole. What actually makes up a community, and how has it changed? Good question, Justice. Let's go to Max for asking that very question. Thanks, Justin and Ivana. I'm Max. I'm about to interview a few people around the neighborhood and ask about how safe it used to be. My experience is when I first moved to Humboldt Park 10 years ago. At first I felt, um, I didn't feel as comfortable living here. I felt like I couldn't walk through the actual Humboldt Park, um, like the boathouse area. I couldn't walk through there, uh, definitely not at night. And then also, um, you know, even during the day I felt unsafe. When I moved to Humboldt Park it was terrible because you had to be, excuse me, excuse me, can I come through to the gang bangers? You could get shot just walking outside, even if it wasn't for you. You know, these guys, they just would shoot each other from across the street. But life in the neighborhood has been improving. The community is getting together. And uh, having so many lawyers, uh, judges, uh, police officers, and people willing to be working with the community, that makes the difference. The community makes uh, crime levels go down, um, more activity, more programs like this, uh, more youth involvement like you guys makes community a better place. I personally am glad to see that the community is getting better. I've seen it go from a really bad neighborhood uh, to actually very livable. This is now an upcoming neighborhood people want to live here, you know. You talked about the gentrification. Is that happening now here? Oh, totally. I mean, if you look, um, one block behind us is Haddon. Um, it used to be really, really bad neighborhood. You know, if you look now, it's all condos. You know, what happens is someone buys a condo, property tax in the area goes a little higher. People who have lived here forever, even if they own the house, you know, and they're just paying the taxes, can no longer afford to pay the taxes. So they're kind of forced to to sell the house and then another condo comes from there. So, you know, you kind of have to, uh, kind of have to have some kind of money to live in the neighborhood now. The people that live like across the border in the, in Wicker, in the Wicker Park area, they come over here a lot. Uh, there's restaurants that have opened up that cater to more healthy eating. And so that brings people in. The rents are more affordable than other surrounding areas. And so that makes people, you know, come here. Um, and so it becomes more diversified. Brand new condominiums that they are making and a lot of different people moving in, that makes a lot of difference. I think that people from other areas like say Wicker Park, Lakeview, uh, even Logan Square, they get priced out of the rental rates and so they come here looking for something a little more affordable. And you know, it's still within, it's close to downtown, close to um, you know, all the public transportation. So it's nice to live here. Ideally, I would like for the Puerto Ricans to still be able to stay in the neighborhood, you know. Uh, but definitely we all have to work together to, you know, to, to stay together in peace and harmony. Mm -hmm. We've been here, I want to just say, 25 years. So the name of this barbershop is uh, Hayuya Barbershop. Um, and Hayuya is just a small town in Puerto Rico, right in the center, mountainous region. So all of us in this barbershop shop, most of us are from Hayuya, so we're all uh, hibaros, which is kind of like saying uh, hibbly, you know, but a Puerto Rican hibbly, you know. So. I lived in Humble Park for 10 years. This bike shop uh, has been at this location for five years. Before this location, it used to be on North Avenue and Campbell. Now we're on Division and Campbell. Home is right here, uh, but I want to say home is here in Humboldt Park. You know, I'm not going to leave this neighborhood. You know, I have a condo here on uh, Mozart and Cortez. And it's really expensive, you know. So I had to get two other roommates to help pay. You know, because I want to stay here. I refuse to go anywhere else where I don't know anybody. I don't know the community, especially since I'm, I walk out and everybody knows me. You know, I go to Eddie's, I get my free coffee. You know, but I support his network, so it's technically not free, you know, but this is definitely home. When I walk here, I feel like I know everybody, I know everything, I know every, every, uh, every corner, every crack, every gangway, you know. This is definitely, definitely home.
have for today. This is Hardcover News. See you next time. Thank you.